So my name is Kerry Sims. I'm going to talk to you today about chemicals monitoring data for environmental protection and environment agency perspective. So chemicals monitoring at the environment agency is conducted for a variety of purposes. Some of these include surveillance to understand the state of the environment, um, linking to formal chemical classification, which includes some of the ubiquitous persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substances, which we now classify for, which have been added more recently under the Water Framework Directive, where new substances were added because they're priority substances. It also includes consideration of emerging substances to ensure that we're really focusing on the latest substances that pose the greatest risk. It also includes focus work to understand sources and pathways and targeted work on particular groups of chemicals, for instance, for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFAS or forever chemicals. And we're now monitoring for around 43 different perfluorinated chemicals to really try and understand those sort of issues. It also includes monitoring for formal reporting for indicators for the 25-year environment plan, such as the indicator H4, which specifically looks at wildlife trends for chemical pollution. We hold data from a wide range of matrices, um, but the majority of our monitoring is in the water compartment, so both surface water and groundwater, though we also have some substances data on biota and sediment. We also collaborate with partners across the UK nationally, um, such as CFAS, UKCEH, Natural England, Ferrer, Cardiff University, to draw together the information that's available for biota, um, for example, which gives us insights into fish, both freshwater marine, uh, into marine invertebrates like mussels, uh, cetaceans, otters, and terrestrial species such as foxes and predatory birds. And it's fair to say that as scientists, we don't have the amount of monitoring data that we would like to have. Um, but the result of that is that it means that we are working to get the most that we can out of the data that we do have. And that really gives us the best possible insights to the future environmental risks and to link into other data sources. So for our team, that comes from a range of places. It comes from academics, like yourselves, um, at Imperial College London and across the country. It comes from water industries, chemicals, investigation program data and other organisations we collaborate with nationally. And it also comes from our international work, because a lot of the chemical issues we face in this country are mirrored in other countries around the world. So I wanted to start by sharing on some of those innovation approaches that we're starting to take to ensure that we are getting the most relevant data. The first one that I'd like to share on is our microplastics monitoring strategy work, where we're just beginning to shape our strategic work for monitoring microplastics in surface waters. So we're looking at monitoring um, to include water and sediment samples across a focal river catchment from headwaters through the river down to the estuary. We're looking at in consideration of the synthetic polymers as well as tire wear particles and the monitoring strategy to ensure that we're considering both existing microplastic data, there's a lot available from academia, um, there's a lot available from the water industry work that's happened so far, but there's a lot more that we still need to understand in terms of the approaches that are best to take for looking at what's going to give us a useful baseline of microplastics data. We need to understand what will give us the information we need around sources and pathways to rivers and to ensure that we're looking at what will tell us about proposed interventions to reduce microplastic loads entering surface waters. And that's really just the start of forming a proper baseline for continued microplastics monitoring. Over the last year, we've also run a passive samplers project to look at the research and development approaches for use of passive samplers for two groups of chemicals, for pesticides and PFAS, and for a calibration project with Ferrer. So we've developed an LC-MSMS method to detect and quantify 186 different pesticides previously detected in spot sampling in catchment-sensitive farming sites. And we've also developed LCMSMS methods to detect and quantify 47 PFAS compounds identified by the Environment Agency as high risk. And we've also developed LCHRMS screening methods for those pesticide and PFAS compounds, as well as other pesticides and contaminants amenable to the instrument libraries. That gives us the additional benefits of having also non-targeted detection of 674 pesticides and their breakdown products, as well as 254 PFAS compounds. But there's, of course, there's a lot of chemicals data that we have, and I think the Environment Agency might possibly have one of the most underutilised data sets there is in terms of chemicals data, but it's all available on open data. So if you get hold of these slides, there are links to where this information can actually be found. So we've got a combination of fully quantitative data, which includes metals, um, any substance that's a priority substance, 
a number of organic substances from PFAS to PAHs to PCBs, as well as numerous other substances, not just those that begin with the letter P as an acronym. Um, we've also got a large amount of LCMS and GCMS data from our target scans. Um, and those now are looking at 1,614 different substances at all of the sites that we're looking at, having those techniques undertaken at. However, we really recognise that we've got an analytical gap in terms of our target scans, although that's a lot of substances, they're only looking for the things that we have chosen to look for. So we know that there's more that we can do. And we're starting to fill that gap. So as a result, we've begun development of non-target screening development approaches, which depending on the definitions that you use, you might think of it more as suspect screening, depending on the terminologies. So non-target screening methods are really valuable for identifying emerging chemicals of concern in the environment, including breakdown and transformation products and metabolites. So the Environment Agency has already got one non-target screening method for using gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which is really useful for volatile compounds. But until recently, we've never had any development of the LCMS tools. So we've got new methods under development for complex matrices for biota and sediment, and that's about to be followed with the start of the methods being developed for LCMS QTOF approaches for water. That will give us the opportunity to be able to look at the additional options to assist identification of unknown chemicals when we're dealing with pollution incidents. But it will also allow us to be able to feed that information through for new chemicals being added through into our target screening to better understand the risks of further emerging chemicals based on this innovative monitoring evidence. The other thing that we will do is we'll also be able to feed those insights into our prioritisation and early warning system for chemicals of emerging concern. We've always had a lot of monitoring data coming through for chemicals and we've never really had a systematic way in which we can tell people about what we're actually concerned about. So we've developed a system which I'll share a little bit more about now as in my title I also promise some insights into connecting our data to environmental protection. So our prioritisation and early warning system or PUS is our response to the commitment that was made in the 25-year environment plan, which was to explore options to consolidate monitoring and horizon scanning work to develop an early warning system for identifying emerging chemical issues. So that's been fulfilled, taken further with commitments made in the environmental improvement plan that's been published earlier this year, where there's now a commitment to build on our prioritisation and early warning system to ensure that regulation is targeted at the greatest risks. So we've developed an environment agency process, the tools that we need to capture to screen and prioritise emerging and escalating chemicals of concern, and specifically looking at exposure of the environment to substances and to humans when they're exposed to and when they're interacting with the environment. So really going back to that One Health concept. So PUS allows us to better understand our exposure data and to inform future priorities for chemical evaluation, for environmental monitoring and chemical regulation. The system that's set up is currently a system for England, but we're in discussions with our um, equivalents in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland to see whether or not we have potential to make this into a system that would be UK-wide, um, of which the most relevant part of that will be around monitoring data because it will mean that all of the monitoring data for those substances is brought together. So that should then mean that our vision is that we'll end up with a prioritised and harmonised work plan across relevant UK institutions positioning the UK to really make early interventions on significant future issues where that's appropriate. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of an overview of how the system actually works. So the first thing is that anybody can make a nomination into the system. If there's a substance that you've found in your research that you would like us to be aware of, then please tell us. We've got an email address that's set up where you can email pews at environment-agency.gov.uk and let us know if there's something that you think we should be thinking about. It's really important that we can then link that in. So once we've got substances nominated, we also feed in our own quantitative information and qualitative information, so both from our own monitoring. And we feed in information from things that we see um, in the scientific literature. We scan a subset of the scientific literature in terms of what we feed into the work. We feed in insights from collaborations with partners nationally and internationally. And we also feed in information from horizon scanning, both systematic and ad hoc. And all of that information gets funneled into the system. The next step is we look at sifting a substance. We look at whether or not it's occurring in the UK. We look at whether or not it's hazardous by looking at some of the high-level properties. And we look at whether there's public interest in the substance. And at that point, it's sometimes possible that we're able to park and record the substance because it's been demonstrated not to be hazardous or not here in this country or something that we need to worry about here. The majority of the time, most substances are going to need to have more work done. So they're moving on to the next stage of looking at screening 
So the screening step is looking at reviewing exposure information and readily available hazard information. So we look at things like whether it's a persistent organic pollutant, whether it's a substance of very high concern under REACH legislation, whether it's persistent bioaccumulative or toxic. We look at whether it's an endocrine disrupting substance or whether it's under biocides or pesticides regulations. And the work that we're doing in, in this prioritisation early warning system is looking at surface waters, both freshwater and marine. It's looking at groundwater. It's looking at sediment, soil and biota. We're also looking at some of the other available threshold information. So we're looking at human health thresholds, drinking water thresholds, and some of the information that tells us whether or not the substances are persistent bioaccumulative or toxic. So looking at whether or not they're soluble in water, um, whether or not there's different things that we can understand about the behaviour that that substance might expect to have in the environment. The result of that screening is a prioritisation score. So we score one through to four for the surface water and groundwater components. So we come up with a score of priority one or high risk, high certainty for the most concerning substances, all the way through to priority four which is low risk with high certainty, when we're really confident that that particular substance isn't a concern. For soil, biota and sediment, we either flag the substance for further consideration or not, and that reflects that we don't have as much monitoring data for those compartments. Once we've got that prioritisation score, we then look at screening to potential interventions to decide which substances we might need to look at in terms of taking further work. So the final step is looking at the follow-up stages. So we've got potential intervention options. And for some substances, it's been demonstrated that we need to initiate new action to be able to better protect the environment. For some substances, it's shown that we can maintain the work that's already happening to ensure that the measures are being put into place to protect the environment. For the most emerging substances, it's demonstrating that we need to monitor new substances for the first time. And those are then able to be added into our target scans. The final stage is looking at parking and reviewing substances. So for some substances, we're aware of the other work that's going on in relation to those substances. So it might be, for instance, that there's ongoing work in relation to determining whether or not the substance is a substance of very high concern, which then has a cascade effect into regulation via a different route. And the final stage is tracking and reviewing substances. So coming back and revisiting that exposure data, the hazard data as it evolves. And where PUSE is relatively new, we don't necessarily have gone through that process yet of going back and revisiting substances because it hasn't been enough time to go back yet, but we will be doing that in future. So this gives you an overview of what the emerging substances picture currently is in England for the different substances. So we've screened substances in what we call tranches, usually about 20 or so substances at a time. And so far we've screened 215 individual substances but we recognise it's really difficult to always work on a single substance basis given the number of substances we're dealing with. So we've also got grouping approaches where we take the expertise from our chemicals assessment unit where they're working on really large groups of chemicals and feed that into the system so that we can accelerate the work on bigger groups of substances as well. But this just shows you the overview as to where we are in terms of the substances currently. So you can see here we've got 40 substances that we consider of high risk and high certainty to surface waters. 29 to groundwaters, and for soil, biota, and sediment, respectively, you can see we've got 72 that we flag for further consideration, 53 for biota, and 73 for sediment. So you're just starting to get a picture as to just the sheer number of substances that we're starting to deal with. And this is just starting to scratch the surface because we think we're dealing with somewhere in the region of 350,000 substances entering the environment currently. So you can see the scale of difference that we're facing in terms of understanding these risks, which is why there's things going into the scientific literature like novel entities being excluded for planetary boundaries. The most important thing is what we actually do with this information. Because the most important thing is that we actually do something positive as a result of all of this work. So priority substances are then screened for potential intervention and passed through to colleagues for regulatory planning work to be carried out. Uh, we consider a substance's source pathway receptor model. We look at the existing legislative framework that applies and any known interventions that are already ongoing for a substance. And we have ongoing, that we have to look, look through to see whether or not there's any outcome gaps associated with that regulatory work. When we do that regulatory planning work, we consider all three environmental compartments of air, water and land. But we also consider what waste streams a substance might be associated with because waste is often a very common route and pathway for entry into the environment. When we identify an outcome gap, we consider a range of possible interventions that could close that gap, 
And where our resources allow, we look to introduce those. And that often involves us working with partner organisations because a lot of the time the substances that we're dealing with are not substances that the Environment Agency is the direct um, responsible organisation for regulating them. So our regulatory planning work highlights common gaps or themes across a range of substances and we're currently developing a number of work packages because what we're seeing is that there's a lot of commonalities in terms of the issues that we're seeing across a number of substances in terms of the regulatory needs. And we're using these lessons learned from our regulatory planning work to feed back into DEFRA, our government department, to help to shape our chemical strategy that's evolving. I wanted to give you a little bit of an oversight as to what potential intervention looks like for emerging substances. So first of all, my team at the Environment Agency link into the approvals processes with the health and safety executive. So they link into the meetings where there's the discussions held about whether or not a pesticide or a biocide should be approved for use and the review processes associated with those. We also have links from our team into the work associated with UK REACH. So this work, for example, could feed into the decisions around which substances get evaluated next, which in turn would then require industry to go back and to consider providing further hazard information for us to better understand the risks of those substances. Perhaps the biggest one for us is development of new environmental quality standards. So a lot of the time we have PNEC values, the predicted no effect concentrations for substances, but what we don't have is an environmental quality standard, which is what we actually regulate against for permits. So this process is the way that we're able to link into new environmental quality standards being developed, as well as work in relation to the Joint Agency's Groundwater Directive Advisory Group, or JAGDAG, which is the group that decides whether a substance is hazardous to groundwater or not. So it's this route that's been able to take us from emerging substances to be then considered for having these new values determined, which can then link into permitting decisions. And that's often the very first time for these emerging substances being regulated. I've mentioned before that we had some of the work being shown that we need to monitor new substances for the first time, so we're having new monitoring undertaken as a result of this work. So we've had about 82 or so substances added over the last year as a combination of the, this work and some other work that was happening with our laboratory. And we've now got review of further monitoring data um, to happen to understand some of the substances in more detail and looking at longer term trends and method developments. We have the ability to link into broader information sources, for example, the chemicals investigation programme, both in terms of the outputs, but also in terms of using this work to shape the next phases of that work. So chemicals investigation programme three has just finished and that information is now available online, but we're in the early stages now of shaping chemicals investigation programme four. Um, we're looking at liaison and engagement with other regulators. So I mentioned that we're not necessarily the organisation that's responsible for this chemical regulation, but a lot of the work that we need to do is liaising with, for example, the Veterinary Medicines Directorate or with other human health regulators. So it's working in partnership to ensure that the issues that we're seeing are being taken forward elsewhere. We also have a chemical compliance team at the Environment Agency, and they have the ability to link up into e-commerce regulation. So, for example, working with eBay, um, Alibaba, Wish, some of those big organisations that you see selling online to ensure that substances we're concerned about that are restricted aren't being sold in those places. And we also have the ability to use that team to ensure that they're taking forward specific issues that we're concerned about. So, for example, we had a substance that was no longer approved for use at a number of sites across the UK, which was trichloroethylene. And as a result of this work, they've been able to take this work, go back to all of those sites that had, had that ability to use that substance removed, check that they have actually stopped using it and also ensure that they're provided with the appropriate disposal advice so that what happens isn't they stop using the chemical and leave it on a shelf to disappear eventually, that it actually goes into the right disposal route so that it gets disposed of and doesn't a later issue coming through into the environment. So what's next for PUSE? So the first thing we are doing is raising awareness of this work. It is relatively new still but it's really important for us to raise awareness of it so that we have future nominations coming through from people that are doing research, um, which is why I was so positive to be invited here today. Um, the tranche nine results, so the next block of substances are due to be released next month in terms of our latest outputs. And we have a mailing list, so if you would like to be on the mailing list to receive that information, then you just need to email that address and we can add you on to receive that. And I've talked a lot about the potential intervention work, and that's where our focus now needs to go, because that's the most important part to us, to ensure that we are taking forward our latest understanding on emerging substances, to ensure that we are putting in place the potential interventions that we can. But it's very much across society and very much across organisation effort that is needed in relation to addressing emerging substances. <laughs>